I don't know why these Greeks came and made their way to the city of Jerusalem on these great days of the feast, when Jerusalem was milling and teeming with multiplied thousands of people that had come for one of the great feast days of the Jewish people. They had come from all parts of the known world, some to see if they could find a bargain and some if they could see to sell something they had for a high price and others had come just to get with the crowds and others had come for the trip, no doubt, and others had come because they felt they had to to worship in one of these feast days. But here was a group of people that had come for no purpose such as that. They hadn't come to buy or to sell or to see, or they hadn't come to look around or to be entertained. No, they hadn't come for a pleasure trip or a joy trip. They had come with one purpose, to see Jesus. Yes, sir. It's good to see people today with a hunger in their heart. Hungering and thirsting and anxious to know the Lord. They got their Bible and they seem to get lost in it. They go to the place of prayer and they seem to get lost in prayer. They come to the prayer meeting and they seem to be carried away with an awe and a glory and an adoration that they're looking for someone. They come to the church service and they don't come to gallivant and gad and gossip and carry on. They seem to have come to the service, the house of God, to meet the Savior. I say it's good to see somebody that is hungering and thirsting after God. Amen. Remember the psalmist on one occasion said, As the heart panteth after the water brook, so does my soul pant after thee, O thou living God. Amen. What a picture the psalmist gives us of a heart that's hungry and thirsting for God Almighty. How it could have been that a lot of people came for curiosity. A lot of people do. And some people have come to a service and come to a camp meeting or an institute or a convention out of curiosity just to see what's going on, just to see what they do down there. And the Holy Ghost has gotten a hold of them and brought them under conviction, and it has meant their salvation. But these Greeks didn't come for curiosity. It could have been they came out of consideration. You say, well, I don't think so. Well, you have a right to your opinion, and uh, you would certainly allow me then my right to my opinion. It could have been they came out of consideration. They had heard, no doubt, the great stories of the preaching and the miracles and the teachings and the wonderful man called Jesus. And they had heard that he had not been wanted in that country. That they were looking for a way to get rid of him and to destroy him and to kill him. That they just did not have any place for him in the land of Judah nor around Jerusalem. And they could have come out of consideration. Perhaps they came and thought, I'd like to hear him preach one message. I would like to have two, wouldn't you? Amen. Brother Whaley, I'd like to sit at his feet one day Amen. and heard him preach. Wouldn't it have been a wonderful thing to have sat there Amen. on the foothills of the mountain and heard him preach that great sermon on the mount and lost track of time and lost track of days and lost interest in temporal things and earthly things and flowing from the lips of the Son of God, he brought forth that great eternal message, what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Yes, sir. It could have been that they came with consideration. I'd like to hear him preach one message. Amen. Maybe he will preach while we're here. It could be that they had a physical need. And oh, how touching and how... Striking those come when we realize we have an affliction or a disease or an infirmity, the pain, the sorrow, the grief, and we think of those things that assail us and attack us through the powers of the physical. And it might be that they came and thought, maybe the Son of God, that one they call Jesus, would pass by and I could reach out and touch the hem of his garment. I can reach out and say to him, Oh, Jesus, thou couldst make me whole. You have power to do it. It might be they came with such consideration as that. But I go farther. I think they came out of a hunger and a longing and a convicted conscience. I think they have heard the message and the story and the many tales that had traveled back and forth across the Mediterranean of this wonderful one called Jesus. And their hearts were pretty deep. 
And I think in the hunger of their heart, they have come in a search, in a quest for this man. And I believe they have come with an invitation to Jesus, if he'd have been open for an invitation, to say to him, if they don't want you here, if they don't want to serve you, if they don't want your presence, if they don't want your life, if they don't want you here in Jude, Dia, and in Palestine, and Jerusalem, then we've come to take you back with us. Oh, hallelujah. Well, now, let me warn you tonight, if a church, if a congregation, if a family of people don't want the Son of God, it's not going to be very long that he's going to be hanging around the place. And if people don't get their hearts hungry and their hearts open and their will set and give Jesus Christ a holy and a hallowed, a welcome and reception, it won't be long till the Son of God will be crowded out and he'll take his leave and let the people stay high and dry and barren and go on their way. I think the cry from these Jews, these Greeks, lips was the cry of a hungry heart for the bread of life. Jesus had said, I am that bread sent down from heaven. And they had said, give us that bread. Let us find it. I think they were thirsty for the water of life that Jesus had said, I am that water of life. He that drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall thirst no more. And they had come in Christ. Their eyes hadn't come to look upon seemly, nor beauty, nor magnificence, nor stupendous buildings, nor great things of that. They hadn't come to try to make a few pennies or gain a few dollars or sell a thing. They hadn't come to visit friends. They did not come for anything else. Their hungry heart, their longing soul, their yearning spirit within them was longing and yearning for that which would give unto them eternal life. And Jesus Christ is man's only revelation of eternal life. Amen. Would you let me digress here just for a minute? Jesus Christ is God's divine revelation of what man should be and would have been if he had not fallen. No wonder the heart hungers and yearns for him. Yes, sir. All the man saw in Jesus Christ what he could be by grace and what he should have been if man had not fallen from that high and holy pinnacle of God's divine creation. You say, preacher, biblical? Yes, biblical. For what is man that thou art mindful of him and the son of man that thou visitest him? Thou crownest him with glory and honor and settest him over the works of thy hands. Yet we see not yet all things put under him, but we see Jesus. Amen. God's divine revelation of what man by grace can be in the restoration and what man by divine creation was in the beginning by faith. Yes, sir. If you would let me take this one step off in introduction, that is the only standard of life and of hope. And if that isn't your standard and you have anything else for a standard, would you let me just be gentle and kind and say to you, your standard is too low. Yeah. If you've been pointing your finger to sailing everybody else's standard, and your standard hasn't been Christ in you, the hope of glory, then your standard or my standard is too low. Yes, sir. For God's standard of eternal life and real holiness and holy living is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Is that your standard? Amen. Sir, we would see Jesus the standard of God for eternal life. Amen. Sir, we would see Jesus God's divine revelation of holy manhood. Sir, we would see Jesus, the only one who ever did and ever will please God. Some of you started to just make a nominal pro on you. Yes, sir, that's right. I can't please God, neither can you. 
Not a thing that I can do or say or act that will ever please God. It's Christ in me that will please God. Amen. My life fully and totally and absolutely even until Christ is demonstrated and manifest and operates through me in the freedom of God's divine will and God sees Christ in me and is pleased. You say, preacher, biblical, again, let me quote, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. Oh, that's the standard. Thank God. Let's get it up there, old people. Yes. Let's get it up there and let's keep it up there. Amen. Thank God. Let's not take any other standard or any other doctrine or dogma or creed or anything else. Amen. That's a standard for life, he told me. Let's not try to preach anything or present anything or profess anything or put anything else off on a lost world. I think here's where we're hung up today in America. I think we've made the general run of society and the world society of America sick with all of our church entity and put on and profession and prayers and songs and program. And they're looking in the face of the American church tonight and say, show us Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Show us yeah. the Christ. Show us this one who is eternal life. Show us this one who is God's son. Yes, sir. In other words, roll up your sleeves, spiritually speaking. And get out in the dust. And get out of the highways and the byways of life. And demonstrate to us that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lives today. Amen. 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 Yes, sir. God by his power one time created man. And as God created man, he communicated under that great creation called man all the goodness and all the glory that it was possible for man to contain. But man, by that communication, could not find himself, nor did not find himself, nor will never find himself able to retain it except by the power and life of God in him. That great and all wise and all acting and all eternal and all sufficient God upholds all things by the word of his power. Yeah. And when man fell, and he fell, would you let me turn aside? He fell by the same spirit and the same sin that angels fell with. Pride. That all hellish, hateful thing within called pride. That spirit of self-will. That's what pride is. Yeah. A spirit of self-will, of defiant self-will. Sure. That refused to obey God completely and fully. Yeah. Yes, sir. But God, in His great divine plan of redemption, and on the same day that Adam and Eve fell, perhaps, God met mankind, the human race, with this wonderful, so great salvation. Now let's try to break in here quickly into this lesson here tonight, a very brief text, and maybe a very long message. <laughs> Looks like it doesn't make much difference to me whether it's a short text or a long text. I guess I'm just naturally long. So you pray for me. So we would see the only begotten Son of God. Yes, sir. Jesus, the only begotten Son of God. God never did beget another Son. No, sir. You and I are born in the kingdom of God by the Spirit and become sons of God. But Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God. Sir, we would see Jesus, God's only begotten Son. Modernists and liberalists and socialists and all that crowd today would try to tell you and I that it doesn't matter much about the virgin birth of the Son of God. Over in the 22nd chapter of Matthew 41 and 42, I believe the verses are, I didn't check on them. There are two questions that are asked. What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And upon those two great questions hang right and wrong theology. If you and I are wrong in the virgin birth 
of the Son of God, you and I are wrong in all of our theology. Amen. The attack is first made against the virgin birth of the Savior. Yes, sir. They would tell us that that's unimportant. Now think of all more important things and more needful things and let that go. What difference does it make who son he is? If he is not God's only begotten son and if he was not begotten of God and if he does not contain a divine nature as well as a human nature, you and I have no Savior tonight. Amen. No, sir. But he is virgin born. Yeah. And I use those in the right sense. Modernists use those same terms in a false sense. Words are vehicles of speech and this is where so many people are carried away today. They hear a modernist preach over the radio and some of them have even gone so far as to look at them over a television. And some of them follow them back and forth across the country in these great big citywide campaigns and all the contraption and all the Hollywood carrying on and their liquor crowd up on the platform and their modernistic preachers up there the National Council of Churches supporting and backing the whole thing. And they, and they use terminology that's biblical, but they don't mean what you and I think they mean. And you and I grieve the Holy Ghost by listening to them and following them and amending them and putting our slaves in order and following them. Mary knew that he was the Son of God. Amen. And I would just about as leave take Mary's word if I were some modernistic teacher or preacher. Amen. When the angel said to Mary, how can this be, seeing I know no man? And the angel said, the Holy Ghost shall overshadow thee, and the power of the highest shall come upon thee. And that holy thing that shall be born in thee shall be the Son of God. Amen. Amen. And Joseph knew that that babe to be born was not his child. And when he found that Mary was heavy with child, very far gone, Joseph sought to pull her away and not make a public. And an angel had to come from heaven and change Joseph's mind and prove to Joseph that she had not committed adultery nor committed sin. She was a child of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. Angels believed it. And Joseph knew it. And Mary knew it. Yes, sir. Her we would see him who was conceived of the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead and buried, and rose again the third day, and is ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father. Yes, sir. Brother, we need to get back today in the whole smooth. There's some sane, sensible, foundation, practical teachings of the fundamental, basic things that means the anchor of our souls and the settling of our theology and to bring us out of confusion and the keeping us from being carried aside with every little wind of doctrine and every little sniffle that comes and every little popular horn tutor that ever steps out on the platform. Yes, right. yes sir. Right. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank God. Yeah. Looks like I'm hung up here for a few minutes. We'll stick on this just a little longer. The reason why we so easily give in on so much of this is because we've never got it settled down in the deep of our soul. Right. Yeah. It's alarming. It's amazing the questions that run through people's minds. It's amazing who people are following today, listening to, and catering to. And are saying down the heart, maybe he's right. Maybe there's something to that. Mm -hmm. How many witnesses do you need to make a thing true by the Bible? In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall truth be settled by God's word. One of the prophets 
prophesied and said, A virgin shall be with child. That was the miracle. That's why modernists are against it. They would like to rationalize that thing and say, That's impossible. For a virgin to have a baby, that's impossible. It is with them. Yes, sir. But not with God. A virgin shall be with child. Yes, sir. Amen. And to the evangelists, Matthew and Luke witnessed to his birth and testified that he was born of the Virgin Mary. Yes, sir. You have the angels, you have Mary, you have Joseph, you have the prophet back there, and you have Matthew, and you have Luke that testify that Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary and is the only begotten Son of God. Yes, sir. And some people would come at you and say, and these are some of the arguments. Well, if that was so, then why didn't Mark and John speak of it? And because they didn't speak of his virgin birth, then it's not so. That's nonsense. That's arguing from a false premise. Because they know it was so, therefore they said nothing about it. If it hadn't been so, they were refuted the error. They didn't have any reason to speak of his virgin birth, for they started with his earthly ministry. And they didn't speak of his virgin birth or any other part of his birth. But they sanctioned. And John and Mark both call him the Son of God. And John speaks of him over and over again as the only begotten Son of God. Amen. If that kind of argument of the soul, then the Son of God never ascended. But one of them never mentions his ascension. If that were so, then he was not true about the revelation of the sermon out there on the Mount of Transfiguration. For John never mentioned. Mount of Transfiguration. Yet all of the three gospel writers tell us that John was one of the three that was on the Mount of Transfiguration with him. Sir. Sir, we would see Jesus, God's only begotten Son, as the Bible sets him forward in divine revelation and settle our theology for good. That he is God's only begotten Son, the only Savior that will ever come into the world, the only Messiah that man will ever know, the only hope of eternal life. Yes, sir. The prophet says he's not Joseph's son. Mary says he's not Joseph's son. Joseph says he's not my son. God says he's not Joseph's son. Angel says he's not Joseph's son. All four of the evangelists say he's not Joseph's son. Who are you and I going to believe? Uh, I'm around here with our little social gospel, our liberalism, and our popular wholeness today. No. Yes, sir. Sir, we would see you. God only. Sir, we would see Jesus, the only forgiver of sin. For there is no other mediator between God and man, save the man Christ Jesus. The only one who can forgive sin. For he was manifested, John tells us in 1 John 5, 8, I believe it is. For he was manifested to destroy the works of the dead. To go down into the deep of the pollution, go down into the deep of the awful power of sin in the human heart, go down deep into the depths of a human soul to where sin is stained and corrupted and defiled and cleanse a heart from the work of sin. He was manifested to destroy the works of the dead. But you can hear somebody cry out, but preacher, though he would destroy the works of the devil, I have a record out there against me. I have already written a record of sin. That past that faces me, that present that stares me in the face,
place. Those skeletons in the closet that rattle and keep me awake at night. Those horrible nightmares. Those terrible pictures that are hung on the walls of my mind. The awful memory of the past. That conscience that condemns me of my guilt. But you hear the word of God come over him. He was destroyed. He was manifested to take away our sin. And in him is no sin. Amen. Oh, bless him. Amen. Sir, we would see Jesus, the only forgiver of sins, Amen. the one who was manifested to take away our sins. Thank God. Not just deal with the thing in general, but deal with the thing part of the end personally. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, when a man wakes up or a person wakes up to the fact that I have sinned. The recording angel has written down a record against my faith. Mm. I, I have spoken words that were not right. Mm. I have told things that were not true. Mm. I have gone to places that wielded the wrong influence. I have lived a life that hasn't glorified God. Yeah. If I die, I'll wake up in hell. Mm. I am under the curse of God and the wrath of God. And the wages of sin, which is death, are mine. I am a poor, vile sinner by choice. I have willfully sinned. I have deliberately sinned. I have hatefully and horribly sinned. <laughs> and hear him say, though your sin be as it, it shall be white like snow. Though it be red like crimson, it shall be as wool. Brother, when you face that horrible nightmare, that terrible record, that wretched, vile, awful past that's recorded against you, God says, come let us reason together. Yes. Yes. He's not rationalizing. He's trying to bring us to our senses. Fallen man in the insanity of his moral life. God is saying, come you insane sinner." that has rebelled against God and sown to the wind that will reap the whirlwind and has chosen the wages of sin which is death rather than the gift of God, come, let me reason with you and restore back to you a sound sensibility and a sound mind that you might think straight and let you know that forgiveness with you. Thank God there's mercy with God. Amen. Let the wicked forsake his way to the unrighteous man is taught, and that he turn to God and he will have mercy. And let the Lord, Lord, for he will have won and Hallelujah! Amen. 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 Sir, let them go around with a guilt of sin and a burden of sin, Amen. and a guilt complex, and a shade over your face, and a cloud over your soul, and a ankle out there on the thing. You don't have to do it. God has made provision through Jesus Christ.
And people saying they've gone too far. There's no hope. And nobody else taking any interest in you. Nobody showing any concern. And out there, when you're just about to the limit of despair, and despair is the last thing that can come to the human heart. There's only one step out of despair as far as the human race is concerned, and that's suicide. The Son of God walks. Stretches out those precious nail pierced hands. He says, I will blot out your iniquity as a fact. I will cast all of your sins on my back. I will cast them into the sea and remember them against you. Those oaths that have fallen on God's ears, those blasphemous <coughs> words that have drawn and made angels draw back in horror, as you and I let them slip through our lips. Those lies that have been told that have reached an awful life. Those things that stick to us and cling to us that we've taken and kept. Those restitutions that we don't know how to make, though there seems like there's no way to make them. Yes, sir. Brother, did you wonder out there? Almost ready to put a gun to your temple. Or oh, break that glass of poison. Or oh, make that fatal plunge. Or oh, put the noose around your neck. And step off of that barrel or table or keg. I've got the wood and get out of this thing. And the Son of God comes with a hope. I'll forgive you. I'll never throw it up to you again. I'll never remind you. I'll erase the writing off of the record. I'll put it out. I'll put it behind my back where men and devils can never get to it. And it'll never be charged with against you again. I'll run it out in the thick cloud. Bless you, King. It was Jesus who walked the weary road. It was Jesus who carried all my load. It was Jesus. You folks don't want him here. I'd certainly take him back with all he's got with me to Alabama. If you folks are not going to receive him and open your hearts and let him bring you into a revival in the true gospel chapel, I want you to know you're looking in the face of one tonight that would be glad to take him back with all he would have for lost you and me. For my heart hungers for him. My soul longs for him. Oh, I'd rather have him as guest in my home for my wife and daughters than any one that ever walked the dusty trail on the road. What do you say, preacher? Worse than that? I have committed fornication. All other sins are outside the body, but that sin of fornication is against the body and against God. Horrible, dark midnight hour. Virtue gone and chastity gone and purity gone. A shame to look a clean, noble mother in the face and a shame to think of a virtuous, broad-shouldered, honest dad that I just ruined. That sin of the man back in the Old Testament that one be stoned to death if they committed. Yes, sir. And if I had my just due, never one for the mercy and the grace of God, stones would have beaten my body into the dust and broken my ribs and beaten the brains out of my head, and I would be in eternity tonight. I have committed adultery. Against a virtuous, noble, pure child, wife that has confidence in me. 
and against a pure, precious child, or against a noble, hard-working, honest, trusting man. Preacher, it's going to take more than church down. It's going to take more than water baptism. It's going to take more than kneeling around the sacrament table. Ever deal with my sin? Yes, sir. Sin that makes us shudder when you read it in the Bible is the same sin of my life. I have wrecked a young person's life and caused her to take her own life, but tonight she's in hell. I'm the father of a fatherless babe out there. And my grand, my mother, and my dad don't know that they're a grandparent of a babe over in China, or over in Japan, or some island of the sea, or Germany, or Africa, or Crete, or Italy. The horrible memories, the awful pictures, the outlandish things, the little fingers, the tears in a woman's face, the awful cry, the night that I roll and toss, the thing that's given me a long stomach, and the thing that's fell out of me like whirlwinds to hell. Sir, we would see Jesus. The old and forgiver of sins. Yes, sir. Oh, thank God. Aren't you glad it came? Yes. yes. What did he have to come, sir? What did he have to come, madam? What if tonight he had to face it without mercy, without grace? What if he had to face it tonight? Without a valid open in the house of David for a sin and uncleanness. I put you down and reach me yet. I've murdered a man. I'm a murderer. I've taken the lives of unborn infants. I didn't want to be a mother. I didn't want to have a large family. I can illustrate this, but I hesitate. There are some illustrations and some things you can't hear in a mixed audience. But we must deal with sin. Amen. Yeah. Sin. Yeah. That awful, heinous, hellish thing that sent angels out of heaven and made a hell. Never was a hell that angels fell. That awful thing that sent boys and girls and moms and dads and men women into the fires of eternal heaven. Yes, sir. I think preaching by him on the mountain section to one of our states a number of years ago. A man looked up in my face to the altar and he said, Brother Kendall, great God, five times a hundred. I fell on my knees before the true arm around his neck and said, Thank God for the marvelous grace of God that can reach the vilest of the sinner in the depths of pollution and rot and torment and hell if he'll repent of his sins. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, thank God. Thank God. You say, preacher, I never killed anybody. Did you ever hate anybody? He that hated his brother is a murderer. Yes, sir. Anybody tonight you're not speaking to? Oh. Anybody tonight you just as weep, they'd never come and visit you? Oh. Anybody tonight you never go sit down by even in church? Think of it, to come to church and have people in the church you wouldn't dare go sit down by. Oh, my God, my God. Think of it, have people in the same church if you could pop it up. You would be caught in the same aisle or on the same side of the church. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh. Sir, I would see Jesus for this awful feeling, this awful spirit in my heart has made me a murderer in God's. Anything that's not love and it has got to be the opposite of it, which is hate. Yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. And if you don't have divine love, you don't have divine love for everybody, then you've got to have hate. That's right. Yes, sir. If there's not love, boy, get down. There's hate. Anybody you would dare step over and put arm around in the same sex you are? Anybody you wouldn't be glad to say, scoot over, let me sit by you and carry it on? Anybody you'd look around and eye around and, and think and turn off in another direction? If you're big around there, if you'll be real honest, you'll find unforgiveness oh, and malice yeah. and hate, yeah. which marks you in God's eye a murderer. Yes, and no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. What do you mean saying you're on your way to heaven? What do you mean trying to think you're on your way to heaven? What do you mean telling others you're going to meet them later? the Son of God. Talk about sin. All these other things fade into oblivion. When you're made conscious and I was made conscious of the fact that these hands helped to plant the crown of thorns and drive them down on his teeth. And these hands helped to lay on the lashes and helped to nail him to the cross and help to lift the cross up in the air and drop her and let her go. I'll have not him. He'll not rule over me. No, sir. He'll not be king of my life. He'll not tell me what to do. And I have actually, with these hands and my food and my spirit, crucified the Son of God and put him to open chains. Until I'm going to keep on going there that way. Maybe one more time, there will remain no more place of repentance, but a certain fearful looking to of the judgment and of the fiery indignation of God. Oh. Sir, we would see Jesus that looked out over his crucifiers and said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do.
and bury her husband and the father of her children and slip her arm around her and talk to her. And a lot of other people have never traveled that road came. But they've gone that path away. Mm-hmm. That loving, tender, compassionate shepherd that has suffered in all places and through all things like you and I. Yes. And he's able to suffer you and I when we suffer mm-hmm. and when we're tender. Praise God. That love, that loving, compassionate child who is ready to forgive and forgive. Other people know. They throw it up to you. They testify at you. They pray at you. They say, remember this. They say, we'll give you a trial. We'll put them on trial for a while. See, what if the Son of God had done me that way? What if he had done you that way? And left you out there at the mercy of the world and the mercy of the The last one I was going to miss it. I'm sure I'd have missed it. I'm sure I'd have missed it. If I were just going to let people deal with me, I'd have missed it. The Son of God came to my rescue. Bless him. I met just now. A little popular worldly church. Come on, almost making an infidel out of me. From the time I was 15 years old until I was 34 years old, I hardly got at a church door. That one just about took me down the road that he wanted to take me into eternity. And I remember when I was gone to the farm and Sadiq. And seeing it so devastated my body and disease that so tore me to shreds till I weighed a little more than a hundred pounds. And being sent away there to be cared for by specialists and see if there was any chance to save life. I will tell you, then I walked the path of sin, but a good old day, but a backslider the way from God. And dad and son together had walked the trail of sin. I remember when I sat in the car, they were driving away. My dad stood on the side of the car. I saw him fighting back the tears. He said, Goodbye, Stanley. He said, We'll see you. You'll be back. Boy, we'll, we'll be together. And I drove off. And God, in His mercy, ever took from me. And my dad told me after I came back, He said, Stanley, I turned and said to your mother, they'll bring him back in a car. He'll never come back alive. I say, the Son of God rescued my soul. When God saved in the old cow barn home, you say, why did he save in the cow barn? Nobody else cared for me. Nobody else cared. How many of you cared for me? How many am I caring for me? God had to convict me and follow me and broke me down under conviction in an old cow stall back in the old cow bar on King's Ridge on top of the hills of an old Carroll County farm in the state of Kentucky. I'd be in hell. Nobody there. My family said he's gone too far. Yes, sir. There was no one who was going to be the last winter before God saved me and boys that I knew Men that I knew that professed Christianity, some of them would say, we ought to go down and pray with Stanley Kendall. It's an awful thing. I certainly am not voting in it for a man to go that far. They said one another, there's no need to go down. He curses out the house. And he didn't come. God in his mercy rescued my soul from that. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Met a Mary Magdalene, filled with seven devils. Met me that day. 
The same one that met the man of Gadal out there in the tomb said, so Be that they did. Sir, when we would see Jesus, the only forgiver of sins, the only loving, tender, compassionate shepherd that cares. Oh, that's the greatest thought that can pass through the sinner's mind, is that Jesus cares for me. Yeah, sure, sure. Cares. Yeah. For those who may show me his eyes, his family may show me out. And Lovers may cast you down, and the church may even shove you back and shove you out. But there's one that can. Oh, His name is Jesus. Oh, His name is Jesus.
When you get the meaning of what it is to live, when you get the message of what it is to be a Christian, when you catch a vision of eternal life, these other things down here lose all their appeal and trust. Yes, sir. And they drop off. Yes. That's what he's trying to do. I'm here to be a living witness of the Christ. Yes. I'm here to demonstrate Christianity. Yes. I'm here to make people hungry for heaven. Yes. I'm here to represent the Christ on earth. Amen. Beloved, it's a full-time job. Yes, sir. Yes. It's too big a job for any one of us. Amen. Yes, sir. Yes. And any one of us can't do the entire thing. No. Brother Antrim has a place I can't see. He has souls I couldn't reach. Brother Carpenter has souls that Antrim and Early and Kendall, no other preacher could reach. And so do you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Think. If that church is not an enemy of harmony. Think of the one that must be reached by you or by me. And my life is discarded and out of order. And it's not reached. Think of my life and my membership in the body. Bringing discord and disharmony. And hindering the work of the rest of the body. And limiting the salvation of souls. Would you let me take it one step farther? And God had to take in a short while that dead member off and cast it aside and get rid of you. He's given you your last trial. He's given you your last opportunity. He's thrown this revival across your path when you take it to advantage. The next thing will be a dismembering of it and casting you or me into death. Now the body can be powerful and forceful under the great working of the power of the Spirit. Yeah. You or I may be marked for death tonight if we don't let God have His way in our heart and life. God's going to manifest the Savior. God's going to get to all souls. God's not going to let you and I stand in the way and continually block lost souls and block the Bible and keep lost souls out of the kingdom of God because we won't pay the price and reveal Jesus Christ. There's no other one to lift up. I, if I be lifted up, Jesus said, will draw all men unto me. Yeah. People say, wonder why we're not having the crowd. Wonder why people are not coming. There's only one answer. You don't ask it the second time. We're not lifting up the Christ. Like to see it? She said, no, I don't care to see it. 
She said it's on the third floor. And she named it out. The lady said, why, have you visited there? She said, no, no. She said, I haven't. But God wants me to take that apartment. He has a work for me to do. It's a little cheaper than where I'm living now. The lady said, you don't want to see it? She said, no, God has selected it for me. I'm talking about being crucified to sin. Now that old self life within you that's populated hell and took angels out of heaven, it's not in you to send you to hell. Does God really rule your life tonight? Does he rule mine? Would you dare put your left hand on your heart and raise your right hand toward heaven and say, God is supreme in my life? God rules it. Or is there still part of an old self wheel that would want to know and want to look and want to see and want to argue? Sir, we would see Jesus who said, Sacrifice and offerings thou wouldst not. But a body hast thou made me. Lo, in the volume of the book it is written to me, I have come to do thy will. Amen. Amen. You gave me a body to serve you in. You gave me a body to glorify you in. You gave me a body to offer to you as a living sacrifice, and I have fulfilled it. I have glorified thee on the earth. Now glorify thou me with the glory which I had with thee from the beginning. Son of God to ever go back from earth to heaven and ascend to the throne again and that was to glorify God and to take a human body and live as a man and live in the power of the spirit free from carnality and free from selfish self will and free from every disobedience and glorify God in a human body on earth yes, sir. and there's no other way for you and I to the past from earth to heaven other than this no, oh, sir. Any other standard than this is false. Any other hope than this is deceiving. Yes, sir. God has given you and I a body. And Paul said, and he couldn't use any stronger, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. I'd like to preach on that one night, the mercies of God. There's no stronger appeal to the sensibility of man that I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Yes, sir. What you owe God for his mercy. Yeah. How indebted you are to God for his mercy. Yeah. That you present your body a living sacrifice. Yeah. Holy and acceptable to God. Yeah. For you are not too old. You are bought by the price. Therefore, glorify God in your spirit and in your body with your God. Amen. John is too so. One of our lady preachers on the mission field a number of years ago. Very cardinal. Moved among his ladies and moved out of the other outposts with a high regard and respect in everybody's ears and heart. Mission workers would come home and our missionaries would come home and talk about that godly land. One morning standing in his little house, he walked out the door early in the morning as the sun was rising, the birds were beginning to cheer and sing, and he was standing there thinking of God and adoring God and looking upon the beautiful sunrise. And he's standing there lost in the grandeur and glory of God. A uh, heathen woman came down the street with a little package in her arm wrapped up in an eel kept sort of a sack like thing. And she walked past Johnny Suso. She just stepped over into his yard and dropped in his arm and said, Here's the fruit of your sin. And Johnny Suso was so taken back. He gasped for a minute and the woman was gone. And he walked back in the house and thought, What is it? He unwrapped the package. And I knew it was not mine. And I said, Oh God, 
what would you have me to do? And God said, Johnny, I want that child in heaven. And I couldn't get that child in heaven only to get it into your hands. And I'll let your reputation go when you're ready to go. And I'll let you stand in the coach in the spittle from the ball pit to get that child in. Johnny Suso said, I love that baby as though it was fine. He said, if a real baby had been made in my arms of my own, I couldn't love it anymore. He said, I snuggled that baby in my heart with him and kissed it and cherished it and loved it with a love that was God's as God loved it. And Johnny Suso went through life suffering. Barred, kissed at, spit upon, ridiculed, and mocked. Everything of shame thrown upon the man. Boy, to nourish that baby and care for that baby and love it and care for it and let it to God. And I think when the child maybe was 13 years old, the woman stood up in one of the services, Johnny sitting in the back of the service, ready to slip out because of the shame that was on his baby, but clear before God. And a strange woman stood to her feet and said, I want to make a testimony in this village. God has saved me. And I charged a man with sin in this village one day, a number of years ago, and laid a baby that I didn't want. It is on the I want to confess that I lied to do what this baby. It was mine. Oh, sir, we would see Jesus in the church. It's not a shame to take the reproach and bear the shame bear the mockery and not make himself of any reputation but to seek loss. It means something to profess to be a Christian. It means something to profess to be saved and sanctified. Let's not profess it unless we got it. Let's not bring shame and reproach upon the name of the Savior unless we have it. Let's not deceive somebody else and lead them down to hell with us if we're not going to pay the price and have each other life. Mm. Sir, we would see Jesus, for we are dying people. The grave will soon clothe me and you. This mortal body will soon give way to the powers of physical death. Sir, we would see Jesus, for we're a dying people. He who has power over death, and who has conquered death, and who has risen out from death, we would see him. Yes, Yes, sir. 
the very divine nature, the very divine likeness of himself. Will he see it? Back in Illinois a number of years ago, one of the other evangelists, a man with the name of Stuart, met him one day and said to him, do you remember my son? He said, yes, I do, Father. He said he left home. He said, how long did he go? And he told him, he said, no, I haven't seen him. He said, if you ever see him, tell him that dad's waiting for him and looking for him and longing for him to come back. The evangelist said, Mr. Stewart, I certainly will. A year or two later, he was back through the same town. And old Mr. Stewart was walking back and forth on the platform of the depot. And the man was had a little time between trains and he slipped out, put his arm around and said, Mr. Stewart. He said, yes, sir. He said, I've met every train since he's been gone. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to meet every one until I die. And I'm coming back. <laughs> and the man said, well, I was standing there. The other train pulled in for me to catch. And he said, as I started to excuse myself, I said to Mr. Stewart, I trust he comes back. I appreciate your faithfulness and your love. My God, Eddie. And he said, I saw a man walking down the platform, a little suitcase in his hand, his coat thrown over his arm, and he said as he came, something with him, and he said, that's his boy. And that's his boy. And he said, in a little while, I saw those two falling in a breeze. And he said, I thought, I watched Stuart and just said, I'll um, be ever trying to Oh, my God. Does the world see this in your eyes? Do they know it? They'll die seeking me. They'll die searching for me. They'll die waiting on me. They'll die serving me. They'll die interceding for me to have eternal life. They will be that How can you dare say you're a witness to Christ and not have that kind of love? Why would you dare make yourself in the true church tonight and not have that kind of love? <clears throat> Preaching back to Hope again a number of years ago. Would you like to have this eternal life be purchased for you? Would you like to have it? Behold, he stands at your door knocking. Would you dare to open for the door and let him be? Sinner friend, Backslider, lukewarm, liberal, loose church member. One who has drifted, one who has let wrong or bitterness come into your heart, one who has left your first love. Though there may be many things to come in your value, you've left your first love. Tonight, tonight, don't you have him in his fullness? Tonight, don't you have him in his divine grace and power? Tonight, tonight, would there be a question mark about God seeing Christ in you? Would you like to have Sister Barbara sing one verse? You ever saw it again? Thank you.